Americans took the decisive step. Representatives from all the American colonies signed the Declaration of Independence. The British response was to send a large military expedition to quell the rebellion. Admiral Richard Howe was in charge of British naval forces. His brother William had command of the army. Admiral Howe believed that a negotiated peace was possible, and he was granted permission by King George III to attempt a settlement. He wrote a letter to a number of distinguished Americans offering to seek a peace agreement. He hoped especially for a response from Benjamin Franklin, with whom he was friendly during Franklin's days as a colonial agent in London. Franklin introduced Howe's letter at a session of the Continental Congress, which then met in Philadelphia. The Congress authorized Franklin, John Adams of Massachusetts, and Edward Rutledge of South Carolina to meet Admiral Howe to determine if he had anything of substance to offer. The meeting took place in this building, which was then known as the Billup House, after its original owner, Captain Christopher Billup. Let us imagine that this is the very day they met, Friday, September 11th, 1776. It is a meeting of enemies under a flag of truce. The flag is essential. If captured, the three Americans would be tried and hanged as traitors. On this occasion, however, Admiral Howe guaranteed their safety. The American delegation needed two days to travel from Philadelphia to Perth Amboy, New Jersey. They traveled by coach over rough roads, stopping now and then to take a meal and stretch aching limbs. They stopped overnight in New Brunswick. Rooms being scarce, Franklin and Adams had to share a small room with a single bed. Perth Amboy, just across the river, is held by rebels. Staten Island is a British fortress. 32,000 British redcoats and Hessian mercenaries are stationed here. The sounds of musket and cannon shots fired from one side of the river to the other is a daily routine. As proof of his good intentions, Admiral Howe sent one of his officers as a hostage to be held by American forces until the delegation returned to New Jersey. The Americans, believing that Howe would be true to his word, had the hostage sit in the boat and cross the narrows with him. Let's follow Admiral Howe as he goes to greet the American delegation. Gentlemen, you bring my hostage to me. You have my high regard, and you may consider it and depend upon it that I will keep it the most sacred of things. I trust that your journey was reasonably comfortable. It was as comfortable as it might be, your lordship, considering that last night I shared a bed with Dr. Franklin, a man whose bulk is superior. I did get, manage to get a night's sleep, but I am the victim of one of his faulty theories. <laughs> I know Franklin well. We played chess together in London. He is a man of active mind and numerous theories, but which of his theories are you alluding to? His theory of catching and avoiding colds. He insisted upon opening the window in our room on a rather chilly night. Fresh air, he said, keeps off colds. His theory was wrong. Started the evening with a slight cold, and by morning it was a bad cold. Adams, my theory is correct, I say. I did not get your cold. <laughs> Always a retort. I see that my old friend is as quick witted as ever. But I have not had the pleasure of meeting the third member of your party. I am Edward Rutledge of South Carolina. South Carolina has not been kind to His Majesty's royal governors. The governors have not been kind to South Carolina. Yes, yes, but with a little goodwill, those grievances will soon be forgotten. Uh, but come, gentlemen, before we talk, we have prepared a repast for you. At this point, Admiral Howe invited his guests to enter the conference house, where a table laden with food awaited them. The menu included good claret, ham, tongue, and mutton. After the luncheon, they sat about a large table and began their discussion. But when everything is settled and the colonies are once again restored to their proper places in the British Empire, there will be no need for a Congress. Your Lordship, 
may consider us in any character you feel proper. We are at liberty to consider ourselves in our true character. It may be a conversation held as among friends. I am willing to consider myself in any character that would be agreeable to your lordship, except that of a British subject. Mr. Adams is a decided character. I think with Dr. Franklin that this conversation may be as among friends. A conversation among friends it shall be. In spite of our disagreements, we British are kindly disposed toward Americans. When American falls, England feels it. I feel the same even more strongly. If America fell, I should feel and lament it like a brother. <laughs> we will do our utmost to spare your lordship that mortification. <laughs> come, come, Dr. Franklin. The issues that divide us are trivial. Surely we can reach an accommodation, reunite our countries and peoples under terms satisfactory to both? Reunite? Surely your lordship is aware that we've declared independence. A rash decision made in the heat of passion. But when calm is restored, I am sure you'll reconsider it. Besides, to put it plainly, I cannot discuss independence. That word is totally unacceptable to his majesty. The Declaration of Independence was proclaimed over two months ago on July 4th. It was America's response to its last treaty with the king. The king's response to that was to send out forces and burn our towns. The Declaration of Independence is not simply an act of rebellion. It sets forth an ideal that is now universally desired in our colonies. It is not in our power, Your Lordship, to treat our colonies as anything other than independent states. For my own part, I vow never to depart from the idea of independence. I am one of the oldest members of Congress, my Lord, having been a member from the beginning. I am very glad this conversation is taking place. I think it will be the opportunity of opening to Great Britain the advantages she would derive from a trade with a free America. Trade with us and you will enrich English commerce, find employment for its people, and revenues for its government. The United States can protect the West India Islands more effectively than England can, to say nothing of the Newfoundland fishery. Highly desirable. But all that can be achieved under the benevolent protection of the British Empire. There's more to it than commerce. The British Empire must protect its subjects and, yes, its interests in many parts of the world. America can confer upon Great Britain more solid advantages. It is her commerce, her strength, her men that we chiefly want. We are a considerable manufactory of men, my lord, but they are increasingly unwilling to fight Britain's wars. If we can reach an agreement that resolves their grievances, they will willingly fight Britain's wars. There have been abuses regarding taxation and other issues. These can be remedied. Detached from the British Empire, your colonies will soon be at war with one another. As members of the empire, a wise and benevolent government will maintain harmony. Fine sentiments, my lord, and I know that you utter them sincerely. But the American people will no longer consent to come again under English rule. I can speak for South Carolina. The royal government was very oppressive last week. Seized the government with our own hands, and the people are now very settled and happy with that government. Under no circumstances will they return again to the king's government. A very uncompromising statement, sir. But consider the alternative, which is to restore his majesty's government by force of arms. A war will last for years and devastate your societies. It is that which I hope to avoid. But this cannot be achieved unless all parties are prepared to compromise. May we hear what compromises your Lordship is authorized to offer us? His Majesty is most generous. He is prepared to issue a blanket pardon to all rebels. All? Friends of mine who are close to your government 
have informed me that there is a secret protocol to this effect, that John Adams' pardon shall come in the form of a rope around his neck. You have managed to annoy quite a few people in London, Mr. Adams. I don't deny it, but I know of no secret protocol. I see. To continue with His Majesty's agenda, a fair settlement of tax grievances and the restoration of representative government that serves its people, is loyal to His Majesty, and which preserves a great empire. All in all, a sensible solution. <laughs> if I was to go into any one of the colonies and tell the citizens that His Majesty is offering them a pardon, I would become a laughing stock. I might well end up in stocks myself. The people are of the opinion that it is His Majesty that ought to apologize to them. We have had our towns burned during winter, and even now, foreign mercenaries are being sent out to deluge our settlements in blood. It is rebellion that has brought about such harsh measures. Gentlemen, we are all civilized men. We are here to put it, to find a way to end the ruinous extremities that follow upon rebellion. My Lordship, you know that I have long favored reconciliation with Great Britain. When I was in London, you and I spoke of it often. But that was a long, long time ago. Too much has changed since then. We have gone too far down the path of independence. There is no turning back. Now, might I suggest, offer another compromise to his lordship? Send out word for authority to negotiate with us as an independent nation. That is a vain hope. I appreciate your candor, gentlemen, but it is clear to me now that no accommodation is possible. The war will go on. You will suffer greatly, and in the end you cannot prevail. Just recently, General Washington's army was soundly thrashed in Long Island. We could see how ragged, half-starved, poorly equipped, and undisciplined his men were. Our agents report that his men leave when their recruitments expire. Quite a few others desert. That does not sound like a population desirous of independence. A prolonged war will cause a great deal of starvation and misery. And when you lose it, the terms will be much harsher. In Long Island, we lost a battle, your lordship, and not a war. Our territory is vast. Our people seized with the idea of liberty. A million British troops and Hessians cannot conquer them. A prolonged war would cost England dearly. Attempt to conquer us, and you will deplete your treasury and impoverish your citizens. Trade with us as equal partners, and you will prosper. We will all prosper. There is, I suppose, no more to be said. I wish you all a safe journey back to your homes and hope that we meet together again in happier circumstances. Adieu, my lord. We thank you for your equanimity and your hospitality. To many historians, the conference on Staten Island was a minor incident. Nothing significant happened. No deal was reached. But something significant did happen. No deal was reached. Three Americans resisted the temptation to compromise the ideal of liberty. As they boarded the barge that would take them back to New Jersey, they knew that the coming years would test America's mettle. But there was something else, something more profound. Their conversation with Admiral Howe made them aware, aware that a sea change was occurring in the affairs of men. The world would never be the same.
that Bacchus's health round swiftly moves. For Bacchus is a friend to love, and he that will this help deny. Down among the dead men, down among the dead men, down, 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 down. Down among the dead men, let them lie.